On guard? Ready? Fence. Halt, halt. Double touch. I got you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you good? Yep. <laughs> My name is Zemo. I've been fencing for 11 years. I'm a USFA A-rated fencer, and I fence at the California Institute of Technology. Hi, I'm Tasha. I've been fencing for 15 years, and I compete on the national level. My name is Cody. I've been fencing for 25 years. I'm a Team USA Olympian and World Champion, and also an instructor. Hi, my name is Nathan. I've been doing kendo for 16 years, and I'm an instructor at Costa Mesa Kendo Dojo. Hi, my name is Katsuchi. I've been doing kendo for 30 years, and I'm an instructor at Get Us Kendo Dojo. Hi, my name is Allison. I've been practicing kendo for 16 years, and I'm a sensei at Costa Mesa Kendo Dojo. I'm super excited. I think today it's our turn to work and try something different. I'm already in the, in the clothes, so I want to play the part. Okay, so for this first challenge, it's all about learning the footwork that you need in order to go back and forth on the strip. So the area that we're standing on is called the strip or the piste, and you can see that there's very little side-to-side -side room. It's all about going back and forth in a linear fashion. The first thing I'm going to teach you is the on guard, or um, the position that you're in whenever you're on the piste. So the way I usually think about it is I would like put my feet together like sideways and then turn my foot and then bring my front foot forward so that the distance between your ankles is also shoulder length. You want to sit low like this, so this, is, this would be my on guard. When you're going forward, you always lift up your front toes first, and then you just take a step forward, and that's the advance. And then the retreat is similar. A back foot first, you grab some distance, and move back, and that's the retreat. You always want to keep your back foot loaded because you want to be able to change directions really quick and like grab distance backwards if your opponent's charging at you, or if you see an opening, you want to like push yourself forward with your back foot. So you want to sort of sit tall. Just make sure your back is straight. I know like you guys always keep your back straight anyways, um, but you don't want to be leaning forward like too much. And then your shoulders are going to be turned so you're facing your opponent and you want to be sort of just looking at them. And then the back arm is really only there to keep your balance. So when you're like moving backwards and forwards, it might like swing a little, but this is kind of like your, your counterweight um, to kind of steer you. The most basic offensive action is just the lunge. You, you extend your arm, front toes up, and then you lunge. And then you, the point of this is obviously just to hit your opponent. The follow-up is called recovery. You recover by bending this back, back knee like this. So when you bend it, it just like, it just rubber bands you back. It pulls you all the way back, and you're back in your on guard. It's gonna be kind of difficult because there's a lot of things that I haven't seen before but I'm willing to give it a shot and see how I could adapt it to my experiences. I really don't know. It looks so similar, but so different from kendo footwork. The power in your left leg is similar to kendo because we do it more in an upright position versus in the knee, but we still have that same kind of propulsion forward. Let's just go over the on guard really quick. So everyone um, go into your on guard positions. Let me see what they look like. Yeah, that looks good. So you want your heels to sort of line up. So like if there's a line like this, these two heels should be in a line. So we're just gonna practice the advance. So toes up, everyone take an advance. Towards me, oh, towards oh. me. <laughs> yes, and again, advance, advance. Make sure you're sitting um, down low. Retreat, retreat, retreat. Katsushi, your, your foot is moving back like this a little bit, so you just want to keep it lined up. And then Allison, I think you want to turn your back foot in a little bit. Yeah, advance, advance. Retreat, retreat. Advance, retreat. Okay, perfect, you guys look great. And then the next step is the lunge, so we're going to do it slowly together. When you lunge, you want to stop when your front foot hits the ground. You don't want to keep going because this is really, it's really easy to injure your knee if you like lunge like this. So you, you want this line to, you, you don't want it to be like this. You want it to stop like here. And so we're just going to try the lunge. So if you're going on guard, so extend your arm, front toes up. Ready? Katsushi, you want your knee to be f like forward, perfect. Allison, make sure your back leg is straight. Straight? Uh, back, yes, there you go, oh. exactly. How's that stretch? Feel good? Hard. <laughs> okay, now to recover, you're just gonna bend your back knee and let it pull you back like this. Yes. And the recover 
good practice to extend your backhand in addition to your front hand. It's sort of you stretch out and you get a lot more reach this way when your both hands are extended. Yeah, and this also keeps you on balance. So if you like lunge weird, you can use your back hand. It's like a rudder. Retreat, retreat, advance, advance, lunge. Yes, perfect. My back foot was not straight like I'm used to in kendo. I think most of the time my back foot was 90 degrees, which was really hard to keep. It's different because we don't really retreat, so when you hit, it's like 100% into that one point, and then when you turn around, you're already ready, but you don't bend your knees as much, so there's a different type of retreat, different type of muscle groups are being used. <sighs> Their footwork is good. Uh, I think they're much more attuned to going forward than they are to going backwards, so a lot of the time, they would go forward a little bit too much, and um, they w weren't ready for the change in direction, so they'd um, be slow in going backwards. Other than that, the footwork was great, and they looked really good. So for this challenge, we're going to be focusing specifically on attacks, which I think you guys will love. We're doing epe today, so every part of the body, including your hand, head, foot, is a valid target. What we'll be going over are normal straight attacks as well as beat attacks. A straight attack to the chest, it could be with an advance or a lunge. I'll demonstrate with an advance right now. So that's to the chest. With a lunge, it would look like this. So you can hit the wrist and you can hit the leg or foot in FA. So the nice thing about these targets is you basically have a target at any kind of fensible distance. So if you want to stay really far away from your opponent, like I do when I fence, I don't like to be in close quarters, the hand is an amazing target because you can stay pretty far away and still have something to hit. When you're in closer distance, that's when you can actually start to hit the body. What you can do if, they have, if your opponent has their blade in the way, you can, like Kendo, kind of give it a little beat out of the way. This is what a beat attack to the chest would look like. Unlike Kendo, this is actually the hardest part of the blade to move away. The fencer has the most of their strength here, and it's very thick. So you want to make sure that you beat their blade away here to be able to expose that target. And it's a small but very sharp it's really similar to the one I taught in the waza and our techniques I taught with the harai. The mechanics are a little different because, again, for kendo, we do use the wrist, but our power comes from the last three fingers and, and the thumb versus we're using the, the top two fingers, and that's what's creating the flick. It's so similar to the concept of harai and kendo, but it's so difficult for me to control the fencing sword right now, so I'm just excited to try it and see what happens. It's gonna be a little interesting how we're gonna be able to adapt our, our style of kendo into fencing. First thing we should talk about now that you're having the weapon is safety in, in fencing is very important. So everybody's got the fingers around the weapon, thumb around the spikes, and you're using what's called a pistol grip. All right, there are two major style of fencing grips. It's a French grip, which is a straight handle. This is a traditional style. Fingers are gonna go on the bottom, and the thumb on top, it's gonna be a pinching motion on top. With a pistol grip, same idea, but you're just gonna have that thumb grip is gonna go around that little spike at the top, but the same idea, you're gonna pinch on the top. Thumb over the first finger. And then there's gonna be a piece on the side that's gonna tuck against your wrist, and that's gonna help give you brace the weapon in your hand and give you a little bit more stability and strength. So Allison, what I'm going to have you do is practice the straight attacks and the different beat attacks on his blade. The first hit will be on the torso and then hold it in there. Perfect. So your arm is up. Your knee can be a little perfect. Great back leg and great arm out. This is a great lunge. Great. And recover. So what we'll do, we'll do the same thing. The reason why I bent underneath is you want to extend your arm first and then follow through with the lunge. There you go. And then the next one is to the wrist. So what you'll want to do is pre when you extend, pre-set up that, that angle. Like this. Let's do one more again. <laughs> so you can angle your blade out a little bit. You hit it. Oh, that counts? Yes. Just a little bit? Yep, oh. perfect. Wonderful. So same thing. Is it okay if it hits this just a little bit and then go? It's the, it's the shield? You're more likely to get the touch if you don't hit the guard at all. 
great. We're gonna do the same thing with the beats. Okay. I'm even turning my wrist. Great, recover. And with the wrist, you want slightly a little more distance because it's this much further out. <laughs> Too much. Okay. Great. That was a good one. Good. A little smaller. Perfect. Really good. You hear that sound? Mm -hmm. It's a really nice sound to hear in fencing. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Yay! <laughs> Woo! I like how it was similar to Kendall from like, I think with our hot eye. And I think with the pistol grip, it kind of helps you in that wrist movement as you squeeze to turn the blade for the beat and then go in. And I think my legs are getting used to the lunges because now my legs feel great. I think the two hardest things for me were hitting the right target and also um, paying attention to my form. I could not get my back foot to stop moving up. This challenge was very similar to the hot eye in Kendo when we're um, knocking the shinai away. It was very similar with knocking the fencing sword. I think their background in Kendo helped because they seemed to know how to beat the blade really well and then adjust back onto the target quickly. I think that that's something that they definitely had an advantage on over other people new to the sport. For our third challenge today, we're now gonna walk through a little bit of the history of our defensive systems in fencing. So the first thing we wanna know about fencing is that obviously it's a middle sport protecting and about using uh, the court rapier. Modern day epe is a court rapier, and so with a thrusting weapon. So the first parry in, in fencing comes from when you're holding your weapon and your scabbard, walking down the street. Somebody were to come to attack you, they come down, I'd have to draw my sword to be able to defend a first attack. So that's the first parry. All the parries that come from that are continuing you to defend yourself from an attack. The numbers of the parries are what we're gonna walk you through today. They're gonna seem a little bit arbitrary, but that's the history of why they go from one to eventually eight. We're gonna be applying the most common three parries. We're gonna work on the high lines and the low line defenses. So he's gonna use the natural defense, which is what we call a lateral parry, which is gonna be moving the blade to the side. And that parry number is number four. He's gonna attack. And then I'm gonna just push that blade to the side. We wanna be able to push that blade aside so that it just misses. He may attack, I may block it very large, but now my tip is far out of position. I might come back in and it would release the blade and open me back up. So we're always trying to find that not too big, not too small, because if I don't cover it enough and he attacks, the attack will break through. All right, so that's gonna be that first parry, parry number four. The next one, is what we're gonna do is a circular six parry. So I'm gonna now scoop the blade up, he's gonna attack. I'm gonna scoop it around, I'm gonna push it to the outside. My tip position is here, I'm just gonna go under, to scoop that out and I'm gonna push it, I'm gonna bring it to that outside. He didn't want to attack that outside and I'm gonna instead force him to go to that different side. So what happens if my opponent attacks me low? Parry four, it's not gonna work, All right? Does the same thing, circular six, Parry, not going to work. So we need to have a low line of defense. So we're gonna do a sweeping parry down. And that's gonna be our parry number eight. Four, to the side, circular, to the outside, and low, to the, to the four, six, and eight. All right, are we ready? I might forget the numbers, but no, uh, I did. <laughs> to me, having eight different parries sounds a lot like kendo kata, which is um, a different type of kendo form that you do with an opponent. It's a set form of movements. I feel like it's the kind of thing where you have to just do it over and over until you get it right, and I'm just curious to see if I can do it or not. All right, let's get on guard positions. Also, you're gonna be working on that parry for that lateral movement. You're just gonna push off to the side, perfect. We wanna admire that, that near miss, and we're just gonna bring that wrist across. And stop. So what we wanna do is we want you to be here. Oh, okay. Yeah, see how much now it's stuck on the strong of your blade. Stop. Now we want this, we're gonna bend your wrist from here. Now it slides down, you see the force comes down to your guard, much better leverage, and your point is in a better position to come back to score. Good. Right, freeze, and go to hit. Good. Next one we're gonna do is that circular one. This one, we're gonna stay again on the, we're gonna keep our hand on the outside. You're gonna end up going around. Perfect, a little bit smaller. 
Good. Trust that motion of the wrist. Circular block. Perfect. And the last one we're going to be working on in the You know, the outside is just going to be that sweep down. Perfect. Go. Down. Perfect. Yes. Ah, uh, Zemo's leveled it up. He's already attacking the leg. So now you have to carry love. Perfect. Zemo's going to do three attacks. You choose whatever pair you want. Perfect. And circle six. And. Oh! And thirty eight. Very good. <laughs> When it comes to kendo, we don't really use too much of the, uh, the index and the thumb uh, when it comes to control. But in fencing, I feel that you are using a lot of the finger for the controls. That could make a really big difference. I feel like the kendo background helped a lot because in kendo, a lot of moves have to be small and sharp. You have to keep your center. You have to be ready for the next hit. I feel like um, the concept of these parries were exactly the same. They did very well. In particular, they adjusted very quickly. So the few corrections I had to make, a couple times they were, the actions were a little wide, which makes sense for my kendo because they can kind of roll that together with their strikes. Once they recognized that change and they were going to make those hits, I think it became very intuitive why it needed to be a little bit smaller, and then it was never a problem. So for our fourth challenge, you just learned how to parry, and now we're going to learn how to avoid your opponent's parry. So just say I'm doing an attack, he's parrying, normally he would catch it, and that would be very difficult for me. But if I want to plan to avoid the parry, since I know he's gonna do it, I can threaten his target, disengage around it, and continue my attack by avoiding the blade. And if he wants to take a circle six, I can go the other way and finish my attack, depending on which parry he takes. If I am threatening his lower targets, like the leg or the hand underneath, I can show and then do that same, it's more of a C shape then, to go around the blade and bring it back up. So it's really fun when you put it together, when you try to deceive your opponent, you can think low to get him to drop the blade and actually hit where you want to hit. The second one is to be able to go over the top of the blade. So if I extend, he takes it, I can whoop, you attack, threaten, draw bridge up, and bring it right back, straight down. And with the cut over, it's nice because you can have the body as an easy target for it, but you can also get this nice hand and arm target with a cut over if you're at a farther distance, so. It's really interesting because we also have in kendo where you want to bait someone, so you kind of bring up like your tip to a target and then your opponent would also think to block and then it opens other opportunities to strike. I feel it's going to be um, a little bit similar to what we do in kendo, uh, where we initiate our attack and then from there we're going to parry or counter attack and try to score our points. And I think this is where we're gonna feel that oh, it's gonna be our comfort zone. It's not very good in kendo, but one of my favorite moves is faking a hit and then going for a different hit. I'm just hoping I can do it with fencing. I really like how smooth Tasha made it look, and I'm hoping I can do something similar. So first we'll have you work on disengaging around Cody's four. He's gonna take four, and do that, disengage the little U underneath his blade and finish your attack. Perfect. Okay, provoke. Now make sure you don't need to drop your arm. It's really tight with the wrist and the fingers. Really good. That was a really nice high finish with your hand. And be confident with your provoke, like really like you can hold it there to make sure he knows you're going to be going for that target to force him to react by taking that parry. Very good. It was a good disengage. Now Cody will be taking um, a six to try to move away your blade. Provoke. Great. Oh. <laughs> I think you tricked him a little. Make sure you provoke him Still to his it. chest. <laughs> It still counts, it still counts. Oh, you gotta wait for him to do something. You have to provoke, you don't provoke, you have to, you have to provoke him. And smaller, it's much smaller. Relax the shoulders, relax the hand. 
Great. Go. Really good. So now we'll work on the cutover. So provoke and great. Perfect. That was really good. More provoke. Very nice. 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 Oh. oh, you gotta, okay. you gotta <laughs> threaten him a little bit. Good. Good. Well done. That was amazing progress. Thank yep. you. That was Spencer speed there, so. Yeah. That was fun and I want to go again. But, um, it just surprised me how fast everything was. In kendo, sometimes you can make a big swing and then go for the next hit. But here, everything has to be very small. If you go too big, then the whole move is going to get messed up. I think what surprised me is like the similarities that of the, of the baiting and then using the parries and using someone's defenses against them. You have to read your opponent's movements, how they breathe and what they're going to do. And you have to anticipate all that together. I think uh, kendo and, and fencing is very similar in that way. They did a really great job in this challenge. They got the exercise really quickly. It's amazing to think that today was their first day fencing. Okay, so now we're gonna put together everything you've learned today and just let you guys go at it and have a sort of a mock match between you guys. So for the pool rounds, how it usually works, you get three minutes to fence. The first person to get to five points wins. The clock stops whenever you get a point, so everybody resets and there'll be a referee directing everything, awarding points. We're gonna have Cody and Tasha demonstrate and they're just gonna hit the other person's bow guards, make sure nothing goes off. So everything's good, they're gonna salute and the ref will go, the score is zero, zero. Uh, on guard, ready, fence. Halt, touch left. So that was Cody's point, so he would get a point. So now the score would be one zero. Halt, touch left. So if, if they were at four four and then Cody got the point, that would we would say bout. Winner is the left and they take off their masks, salute. That would be how the match would go. The timing in Epe is you can hit each other at the same time and get a double touch. So if you hit each other within one, one twenty-fifths of a second, so 0.04 seconds, that is a point for both of you. Um, but if you hit like consecutively, like, see that would only be a point for Cody because he hit first and then Tasha hit um, and was not simultaneous. So you'll all go uh, two at a time and we'll make sure that everyone fences uh, everyone else. First to five points wins, so let's do it. I'm really excited to see what I can do. I can't beat these two at kendo, so maybe I can beat them here. <laughs> Go ahead and salute each other. All right, the score is zero, zero. On guard, ready, fence. Halt, 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 touch right. That was a good hit. Ready, fence. Halt, halt, touch left. Nice, score is two, two. Halt, halt, touch left. That was a good touch. Halt, touch left, four, four. Halt, that was a great touch. So that was your point, but touch. So victory left. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ready, fence. Halt, halt, double touch. Halt, touch right, two, one. Ready, fence. Halt, touch right, four, two. Halt, touch left, <laughs> three, four. Halt, double touch, bout, uh, right, four, five. So you take off your masks and then salute. Yay. Awesome. A lot of double touches. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> On guard, ready, fence. Halt, touch left, fence. Halt, touch left, two zero. <laughs> Halt, double touch, three, one. Halt, double touch, four, two. 
Halt. 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 It went great. It was exhilarating to learn something new. Well, the biggest similarities um, that I really appreciate is the respect for both opponents before we start and after we finish. And then even though when we stumbled afterwards and we're still congratulating each other for a, a good match. Oh, I see my progression when I wasn't really comfortable at the beginning. At the end, I, s I saw myself improve. I feel like I just learned a whole new form of art. It surprised me how fast everything was and I didn't expect I would be moving around so much. They looked really good out there, and I was really surprised at just how well they were uh, incorporating all of their skills and attacks and how like deliberate their actions were. It was really great to see them put their kendo skills and to recognize the nuances of some of the small movements. But the big thing, I think, was that they really went out there and they weren't afraid to go for the hit. Normally, when you see new fencers, there's a lot of hesitation and there's a lot of, often, lack of confidence. And they all showed a lot of confidence, a lot of spirit. Fencing and kendo are definitely like more similar I thought. Their sense of distance and timing was really amazing and I believe that truly came from their kendo experience. Often distance and timing is actually takes a while to learn in fencing. Great job. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs>